Okay. Well, welcome everyone uh, to the grant information session today for the Community Foundation of Mississauga. My name is Lorraine Crow, and I'm the Grants and Community Initiatives Manager, uh, sorry, Director, I called myself Manager, and I got, a, I, I, I got a change of title. There you go, Lorraine Crow, Director of Grants and Community Initiatives. Um, and my friend and colleague, Gavin Pollard, is going to be joining me in the session today. Um, in the background, we have Pauline, our office manager, just making everything happen, um, Harisha, with our marketing. Thank you, Harisha, for all the work you've done, pushing the information out for everybody to attend today. And um, our president and CEO, Glenn Gomoka. Thank you, Glenn, for attending. We appreciate all the work that you're doing for Community Foundation of Mississauga and the community. All right, so let's get started. Uh, please allow me to begin our session today on behalf of the Community Foundation of Mississauga by acknowledging that the land on which we gather and on which we, the region of Peel operates is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. In particular, we acknowledge the ter territory of the Ashinaabek, Huron Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe, Chippewa peoples, and the land that is home to the Metis. The most and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the First Credit Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We call on all various levels of government to just not pay lip service with land acknowledgements, but to continue to address the inequities that the Indigenous peoples face and allow them to achieve the 94 calls of action that were addressed by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We also acknowledge the systemic discrimination that many groups face who call this land their home. They came here to seek a better life or to broaden their horizons, but because of the color of their skin, their religion, or some other characteristic, short characteristic, excuse me, they are subject to discrimination. <coughs> I apologize, I've got a cold today. As we meet with each other today, let us commit to respect and uplift each other to tear down the barriers of prejudice, discrimination, and hatred that seem to be getting stronger. Let us resolve to love ourselves and each other and to build a just society for all. And happy Valentine's Day. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, let's get into it. All right, on our agenda, we're gonna talk about the foundation what's new, understanding our grant processes, uh, the really exciting changes to the Nova Nordisk grants, eligibility grants, updates to grant reports and budgets. Um, we're gonna talk about vital signs indicators and our new grant catalog of community needs. We'll talk, we'll do frequently asked questions and you'll have an opportunity to put some questions in the question section on your Zoom meeting, the Q&A. Um, and we will answer those questions as best we can. Uh, just a little housekeeping. All microphones um, will be muted and videos turned off. Uh, please raise any questions in the Q&A section. And please, um, in the chat, just put your name and introduce yourself uh, to the, the people uh, attending today. We'd like to see everyone. I know there was about 175 registrants um, and we'd like to see who is registered and um, to be able to talk to each other in the chat. So questions go in the Q&A and just introduce yourself in the chat. Welcome everyone. And thank you so much for attending today. All right, let's talk a little bit about the foundation uh, in the national scope. We are part of the Community Foundation of Canada and there's 200 foundations in this network. Um, to just let you know about little things that we do, for the Community Foundation of Canada. Um, every time there is some federal money that is going to be uh, distributed to the charitable sector, quite often they will reach out to the Community Foundations of Canada to go into our 200 foundation network across Canada to make sure that the money goes to the right places. Um, they understand that we know our community better than they do, and this is why they partner with us in these efforts. So there were several rounds uh, right back from COVID. Um, I'm gonna throw out some acronyms here for those people that are have been writing a lot of grants in the last few years, you'll recognize these. The ECSF fund, the CHCI fund, 
the CSRF fund and the investment readiness fund. Those are just a few that we um, overlooked through the Community Foundations of Canada. And we helped uh, the Community Foundations distribute over $4 million during that time over the last couple of years. So that's one of our functions with the Community Foundations of Canada, so that anything that um, affects Mississauga, uh, we certainly uh, review that application for them uh, and make recommendations to them for funding. They make the final decisions, but that gives you a little bit, because sometimes when I'm in the community, that's always a little bit of confusion. What is our role uh, with those types of funding rounds? So stay in touch with us, stay on social media, watch our website, uh, be our friend, and you'll see sometimes these, these uh, funding rounds come up quite quickly, um, and we will reach out to you to make applications to them. Um, okay, so that's about the national scope. Um, on local knowledge, uh, of course, we work with municipal and regional governments, local leaders, um, and grassroots charitable organizations to get a keen understanding of what the city we serve. Um, that's really important to us to make sure that we understand the work that you're doing um, and be able to support you in any way we can. Okay, local impact. Since our inception in 2001, we have granted over $24 million to charities at Mississauga. Um, and we're very proud of that number and hope to continue and increase that as we go forward. That's a little bit about the foundation. Okay, so let's talk about the types of funds we have. Um, Again, you can invest our funds, you invest your funds with the Community Foundation Mississauga, and we invest them. And these are different types of funds that they can be invested in. A donor advised. Um, basically, donors can invest their funds with the foundation, and we will recommend charitable organizations to make grants. I'll talk about this a little more because our new catalog of community needs is going to be assisting us in this effort. So those are donor advised funds. Then we have what they call donor designated funds. Donor designated funds are donors actually invest their money and they choose where the money wants to be granted. So they will tell us specifically um, that they want to grant to a particular charity. That's a donor designated fund. And the charity endowed fund, which is really interesting, especially for you registered charities out there, you can invest your funds with us. Um, and then the interest earned is granted back to you unrestricted. That's basically how that works. Some of you have money sitting in bank accounts, uh, savings accounts that don't collect a lot of interest, uh, some in GICs, things like that. You may want to take a look and see whether um, you would like to set up a charity endowed fund with us, um, and then we can uh, invest your money and you can get a bigger return. So we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. Okay, so this is exciting. We are now matching donations up to $5,000 when you establish a charity endowed fund with us. Okay, so if you give us 5,000, we would match that 5,000. If you were able to give us more, we will match up to 5,000. Okay, so when you establish a charity endowed fund at the Community Foundation of Mississauga, your charity can leverage our investment and financial expertise. Okay, so that this is what we're specialties at. Okay, so for, for information, how, how it works, and um, we have a document that you can click on that link. We're going to have this PowerPoint up on our website as well, so you can refer to it. Uh, we also have this recording. Um, so you can go into our website under Charity Endowed Funds Explained, and you can find out how that works. And again, this is uh, matching donation is an offer we're giving right now up to $5,000. Okay. So now let's talk about competitive grants. And these are the grants that you apply for. Um, and uh, they're reviewed by a panel of adjudication committee um, and, dis and decisions are made. And we'll talk about the timing on these, but let's just talk about the Pendle Fund right now, which is the larger fund. Um, it, it offers up to a maximum of $30,000. The Pendle Fund has a wide focus, arts and culture, children, education, environment, indigenous projects, physical and mental health, um, social services, sports and recreation. So take a look at uh, your mission statement, the projects you have, and you might have an application that fits into the Pendle Fund. And again, you can ask for up to $30,000 in the Pendle Fund. Okay, next one, Hazel McCallion 
Fund for Arts, Culture, and Heritage. Um, I know our previous mayor, this was her birthday uh, on Valentine's Day, February 14th. Happy birthday, Hazel, we miss you. Uh, this is her fund and it's very dedicated to arts, culture, and heritage, just like the name. These grants are offered up to a maximum of $10,000. The next fund, Smart and Caring Children and Youth Fund, again, for children and youth, any projects that are involving children and youth, and this particular fund, um, is offered up to a maximum of $3,000. All right, this is exciting. And I know this looks like a lot of words for you and you're thinking, oh my goodness, all right, what are you doing with all these words on the, on the screen? Then the Nova Nordis, um, a very proud partner of ours, uh, they have a, last year, the last two years, they've had the Nova Nordis uh, Obesity and Diabetes 2 uh, fund. Now they've changed this. So take a look at this. There's some changes that may that may be applicable to you. The Nova Nordisk Chronic Disease Fund. Chronic diseases are a growing threat to people and societies and Nova Nordisk primarily is a diabetes and obesity company is also turning its attention to the driving change to defeat serious chronic diseases which affect people every day. For this reason, Nova Nordis is supporting community-based initiatives named, aimed at preventing the rise of chronic diseases, including type one and type two. Previously, they were just doing type two. They are also putting in type one, also staying with obesity, heart disease, liver disease, among others. So anything that would be classified as a chronic disease would be, uh, could be applicable for this fund. So the impact of living with chronic disease they know is significant. So there's all kinds of ways that we can make a difference in the community, um, generating interventions focused on disease education, awareness and prevention. This can be done through food literacy, physical activity, addressing determinants of health to educate equity deserving communities on steps they can take to reduce the risk of developing chronic disease. We're looking to you as a community to come up with some really innovative grant applications on how to address the chronic needs, uh, chronic disease um, issues in Mississauga. So if we take a look at the next slide, we'll see improving one's health could be achieved by addressing some of these determinants of health. Again, you're looking at um, education, okay? How you educate is a different can be very different. You could have um, a film, a play, an art piece, um, you know, looking at outdoor activities. You can have heart healthy walks, nutritious food, organic gardens. I mean, there's so many different things. And I know in the community, you're doing a lot of this work. If you can um, address some chronic disease issues with the work that you're doing, take a look at this fund this year. Again, it's changed, we're excited about it. And it is now gone to a maximum of $25,000 per application. Previously, it was 15. And previously, it was focused on type 2 and obesity. Again, it's, it's a wider uh, catch basin this year. So take a look at it um, and see if one of your projects uh, with your mission statement uh, might be able to apply for this granting round this year. Again, this is going to be up on our website. You'll see all those details. Um, eligibility for granting round. And this, for all the granting rounds that I mentioned, the Pendle, the Hazel, the Children, the Novo, um, you have to be a registered charity to apply for funding from the Community Foundation of Mississauga. However, if you are a not-for-profit, you can partner with a registered charity and still put in an application, but you have to have the registered charity as the, the main person that's going to be um, driving the grant, okay? It has to be Mississauga based. We are the Community Foundation of Mississauga, so it has to be here in Mississauga. You have to be serving people in Mississauga. So if you have an office outside of Mississauga, maybe you're in Toronto, but you're doing work in Mississauga, be very clear about how many people you're serving and how you're going to be delivering that service in Mississauga. You have to have a good standing with CRA and any previous grant reporting obligations must be met. I'm happy to say that everybody with grants last year and the 2023 granting round have reported. So there should be no, uh, no issues there, but 
previous grant reports obligations must be met to be eligible. Ineligible projects, anything that's outside of Mississauga. Again, we're focusing on Mississauga needs. Um, fundraising or campaigning events, we do not uh, fund political or religious activities, sponsorships, scholarships, and bursaries. Um, talking a little bit about the religious activities, if you're a faith-based organization, you can apply for funding. If your project um, is not related to faith education, okay? So you, for instance, if you're a faith-based organization and you have a food bank that you need some help with, you can apply, um, and, but it has to be open to the public, okay? And it's not for religious activities. So I, I just want to mention that because I do get that question quite a lot. Ongoing operating expenses are not covered um, and retroactive funding for any project expenses incurred before the foundation's decision date. So if you have a project that you're already working on, you can apply for money for expenses that have already uh, been incurred. Okay, so that's the eligibility. Okay, so Gavin, I'm gonna take this back to you and perhaps you can talk to people about what's new in the grants portal this year. Sure, thanks, Lorraine. So we launched our new online grants portal a year ago for our 2023 grant rounds. And for those that are new to the call, um, what is the grant portal? So the grant portal is pretty much where you go to log in to apply for your grants, to check your grant history, to look at your grant status, to see if it's been approved or whatnot, and also to receive um, some forms that we do send out. So the grant portal, you can access it through our website, um, through the grant seeker section. And what we heard from users um, based on their, their feedback is that they're really pleased with the grant portal and how, you know, how, how user-friendly it is. There's a really easy registration process, which some of you may be familiar with, the easy application process, and there's a handy dashboard where grantees can retrieve, review, and submit reports. So all positive comments there. What we did hear, though, was that um, on some parts of the grants application, there might have been some confusion around the budget entry areas. Um, it's possible the entry areas may not have been as clear as it could have been. And what we found was that in some cases, applicants were repeating budget information twice, um, certainly at no fault of their own. It's probably just the way the questions were, um, were worded. So for 2024, we've made some changes. We are gonna make the budget area a lot more clear so you can clearly know where to put your project um, your overall project budget information and where you can put your um, grant information separately. Um, we've kind of also restructured the tables so that you can only, you'll only see what tables are applicable to you in terms of the budget entries. And we also have um, an example of how to fill out um, a budget um, on the application itself to help you out. It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, when you go on there, you'll uh, you'll see it. Um, and again, any questions you may have, you can always reach out to us at, um, at the grants team. I should also say that um, this afternoon, uh, we will be um, providing access to the grant portal and you can go on there and you can preview our application um, for a few days. You can download it and you can see the questions in advance. And we'll talk more about that in a, in a bit. Uh, the second piece are grant reports. Um, and for those, again, that are new, what are grant reports? So if the foundation makes a grant to your organization, you're going to need to fill out a report online after your project is completed. And pretty much the, the report, you know, is going to tell us how your project went, your successes, um, any shortcomings you may have had, any learnings um, that came from the, from the event and ultimately how the projects were spent, uh, how, the, how the funds were spent. Um, last year, we set the, due, the, the, the deadline for the reports um, for January of the following year. And what we found with organizations was that that was a huge gap. And organizations after many months, pretty much you know, forgot um, to input their information to, to submit the form. And they were fuzzy on the details of the of the project. So because of that gap, we decided that we would change things around this year. And instead, what's going to happen is on your application, when you enter your project completion date, um, your report is going to be due 30 days after your project is completed. Okay. So for example, if your project end date is June 30th, 
your um, due date for the report is going to be July 30th, so 30 days after. Um, I should also say that um, if your project uh, happens to occur in 2025, that's fine. You can still do a report. It'll be due end of January, and um, your, your final report will be due 30 days after, okay? I know I'm throwing out a lot of dates for you guys, so don't worry. At the end of this uh, presentation, you're going to see a slide with all of our um, project dates, so, so not to worry. And the system is really cool in a way because it also sends out reminder emails, so not to worry. You will also receive reminder emails as to when your reports are due. And the last piece is our um, grant reports in terms of our marketing photos. So what we're doing this year is we are providing organizations with the opportunity to, to upload pictures of their projects. Um, what we found last year was that organizations were telling us their story, how things went, but they had indicated that the area where they um, talk about their impacts was quite short. It was a shorter character limit. So we've increased that area for folks and we've also provided uh, individuals with the opportunity to submit photos and, and video links and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I can say that um, last year when we received reports, um, folks would email us afterwards with additional photos and additional video links. So this year we're gonna include it all on the report for you so you can just upload everything onto, uh, onto the form itself. These uh, photos and videos are really important for us. They're really good for our marketing folks to use. Uh, we are gonna ask on the report if it is possible, if, if we can use those photos and videos for our marketing pieces. There'll be a question on there that simply says yes or no. Um, so please uh, do let us know if we can um, use those, those photos and videos. All right, thanks very much, Gavin. Those changes I think will be um, really beneficial to uh, the charitable community and make things easier for them. So again, we're always looking for feedback on the the work that we're doing, um, and if we can in if we can improve in any way, we're happy to uh, take your comments. Um, again, for those people that logged in a little bit later, you can introduce yourself to everyone in the chat and make sure that you put your questions in the Q and A. Okay. Um, Vital signs and its role in our granting. Um, we have the vital signs document uh, 2021 on our website. Um, and I know that people have been referring to that document to create their grant applications. Um, because it's 2021, people have been asking me, Lorraine, where's your vital signs? Well, the 2025 is pending. Um, it may look a little different. We're looking at different ways to communicate this information to the community. So there's some exciting things happening. Um, and I think you're going to be very pleased with our 2025 um, pending vital signs. In the meantime, when you're doing your grant applications, um, you can pick a category. There's up to two categories that you can choose from. If you're doing a youth project that is... Um, uh, you know, an orchestra or something like that, then you would pick arts and culture and heritage and youth. Okay, so you can pick up the two. The social services is a very wide uh, category, so you can pick that as well as, and if you're working with seniors, that would also be in social services. Maybe you're working with mental health as well. So you can uh, pick up the two. You have to pick at least one. So when you go into our grant application, it's very self-explanatory. The list just comes up and uh, you pick a category. Okay. Next slide. Okay, now, one thing that I often get asked in the community is, you know, how do I write a good grant application? Um, what are you looking for? Okay, so let's go over what, when you're writing a grant application, I was a grant writer previous to this uh, position. Um, I would always be thinking about how are they gonna read this? How are they going to interpret this? How are they going to score this? Okay, so, this is what our adjudication committee looks for. They see if your project's aligned with your mission statement, okay? Sometimes we call that mission drift. If you're an organization that was always working with, um, with seniors and now you want to put a food bank in your, in your um, location and you've never run a food bank before, we would call that a bit of a mission drift. Um, not to say that if that need is there, then please address the need, 
but I would suggest that you partner with someone that has expertise in that area, okay? Uh, so that's the best way to do it. So you wanna make sure that your grant application aligns with your mission statement and you stay the focus of your areas of the grant, uh, that you're, you're good at what you do, this is your mission. If you wanna go outside your mission and you wanna bring in a brand new project, Again, look for partners that are experts in the in the community because there's lots of them out there, okay? So they look at alignment. They look at innovation. Does the project offer innovative research to measure increased efficiencies and improved outcomes of a program? So again, is it innovative? Have, have you got some backup to say that you are an expert in this? This is my research. This is how I know that um, the project is going to have a good outcome. That's innovation. Feasibility, is the project cost-effective and can it be completed within one year? When we're granting, we're looking at uh, a one-year completion for the project. It's not to say that sometimes your project can go on for many years and sometimes we've actually funded that project for a few years. But again, you're always putting, when you're putting in your start date, your end date, you're going with one year. Now think of it as being cost-effective. So for instance, if you're looking for technology equipment, um, and you're looking for, um, what do I put in my budget, okay? Again, this is what the adjudication committee looks at. And they might say, oh, this piece of technology, they're asking a lot of money for this. We know that the market, you can get it cheaper. So make sure that you're doing, um, when you're putting your applications together, get a few quotes on, on the things that you need. Um, and I'm not saying pick the lowest one, but pick the one that you know is reasonable that it's cost effective, okay? Capacity, does your organization have the time, resources, scope to develop the idea, collaborate and deliver the proposed outcomes? So do you have the capacity? If you're looking to do a very large project and there's only three people in your organization, we might, the adjudicators might think, how are they gonna pull this off? Like this thing looks like it needs 50 people and they're saying that they're going to do it. Well, if you have a lot of volunteers that are gonna support you, then make sure that you put that in your grant application that you've already uh, looked at that. You've already considered the idea that you need more resources. Um, and maybe you're partnering with another organization that has that type of expertise and they look at those things favorably, that you're reasonable about how you, um, what capacity you have. And if you wanna do a larger project that usually outside, then you've already been supported with that. We'll look at the impact. Will the proposed project benefit the community? Um, again, you're grassroots, you know what's going on in your community, and we do too. Um, so we want to look at, is this project going to benefit the community? Explain that in your application. How is it going to benefit? What, what needs you see out there and how this particular project is going to um, help that need? Okay. Sustainability. Will your proposed project sustain beyond the granting period? And we do understand that sometimes, uh, especially in the arts and culture, it may be an event, it may be a summer concert that you're doing. Um, but what we want to know is we know it's it's going to have a limited shelf life. You're going to be doing this concert and, and, and then it's going to be completed. But are, what are you learning from that? How are you going to take those, um, take that uh, learning experience and sustain your organization going forward? So those are the types of things. What kind of uh, sustainability do you have and how it will uh, live beyond the granting period. So those are the types of things that the adjudication committee looks for. Um, and they are reading every single word of every single application. Uh, they're looking at all your finances. They're looking at all those types of things. As I mentioned before, the eligibility a section, um, and that's how they're grading them. So that's, that's, uh, that's the answer. What are we looking for? There you go. All right, now I'm gonna bounce this back to you, Gavin, if you wanna go over the timelines. Sure, thanks, Lorraine. So for the um, the grant round will open on February 26th at 9 a.m. But as I mentioned previously, this afternoon, we are gonna open up the portal so that you can log in and you can at least review, preview the application, download it, print it out if you like, so you can get an advance on the questions. Um, but the official application time will be uh, Monday, February 26th at 9 a.m. And then uh, March 22nd, the grant round is gonna close. And I should say that the system will lock it down. So we have no control 
over that. Um, 5 p.m. is the cutoff, so we do ask um, organizations to please um, ensure that uh, they adhere to these timelines. In the spring, April, May is going to be when the deliberation occurs, as Lorraine mentioned, with the committees. Um, they're going to review all the proposals and deliberate accordingly. And then finally, end of spring, May, June, is when uh, you will receive um, uh, an email indicating if you were successful or uh, if you've been uh, denied. And as I mentioned again previously, you can also log into your portal periodically to see your status of your grant. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. All right, so let's talk about the grant catalog. Earlier, I talked about donor advised funds. And remember the donor, they invest their funds with us. And then they come back to us and say, Lorraine, how do I, where, where should I put my money this year? Um, what's the most pressing need of the community? And sometimes they have an idea, like they just want, they want something in environmental. Or they may want something with youth, or they may want something with seniors. But it's our job now to give them the information on the charities that are working in this area. Um, so previously, quite often they would look at um, applications and information that we know uh, from the community, and they would choose from there. So this year, we are putting together the Community Foundation of Mississauga Catalog of Community Needs. Um, and this is created to allow charities to tell us what their needs are in the community, okay? And then we will present these requests to our donor advised funders for consideration in their yearly charitable giving, okay? These grants are unrestricted, okay? So allowing charities to request funny funding for anything that addresses their needs. Um, again, because the grants are unrestricted, it doesn't always mean that you can just, it doesn't mean that you can't ask for something specifically. Like say for instance, you need new shovels for your gardening committee, your seniors gardening committee, and that's gonna cost you whatever shovels are, let's say $500. You can put that number in and say what you would spend it on. The other thing that you can also do is just give us your mission statement. This is the kind of work we're doing. This is the community and the need we're addressing. These are small requests, the maximum of $2,000, okay? Um, Gavin, do you wanna tell everyone about the actual application and how simple it is? I think you need to unmute yourself. So on purpose, we made the application really simple. Um, pretty much it's, Four questions, you know, what are you requesting the funds for? How much are you requesting? What's your mission statement? And pretty much, you know, tell us what your needs are and how the funds you're requesting is going to help address those needs. So pretty basic, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Yeah. Thanks, Gavin. You know, we tried to make it as simple as possible. It's kind of like what you call a one pager. Um, it's it's very, very simple. And again, what we'll do when we collect up um, whoever puts their information in the catalog of community needs, we'll collect those up and then we're going to be presenting uh, those to the donor advised funders, okay? For their choices on how they want to uh, gift their money this year. The applications will be accepted between April 2nd uh, through to June the 28th. Okay, so watch for that. Um, again, our grant realm will be completed by then. Um, and then we look after the donor advised funding. That's why the catalog is during this time period. Okay. All right, now we're gonna get into frequently asked questions. Some of this I've already kind of gone over, but it's always good to repeat. Uh, can two charities partner on one application? I talked about, again, because the Community Foundation in Mississauga um, presently has to gift to a registered charity. Now, last year we talked about uh, doing whatever we can to allow not-for-profits to apply. And we're certainly have been working diligently for an entire year with um, our legal department, with our board, um, but we just got information from CRA last month. You, so you can tell, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a long process to make a switch for us to be able to pay 
not-for-profits, but we are working towards that. But this year in 2024, this granting round, we are only accepting um, registered charities to apply. Again, remember, you can partner with a not-for-profit and as long as the registered charity is the lead charity, okay? You can also have two registered charities partnering with each other. We have a little example here. Not to say that Disney is a registered charity, but we used it because we liked it, didn't we, Gavin? Right? Yes, indeed. Okay, so Disney partners with Sony for a Hazel grant, and therefore Disney or Sony cannot apply for Hazel again by themselves, okay? So think about this. If you're partnering with another organization, okay, you cannot come in with another application in that particular funding round, okay? So if Disney's partnering with Sony and the Hazel, Disney or Sony cannot apply for Hazel again by themselves. I hope that's clear, okay? However, they are both welcome to submit an application to other funds. It has to be a different project. You can't take the same project and shop it around in the four funds that we have, okay? And trust me, we read every word of your application. And sometimes people have got the exact same project and they've called it something else. We understand <laughs> that doesn't get past us. And sadly, with that kind of situation, we have to disqualify all four applications if they've done that. Or maybe they applied in Hazel and they applied in Pendle for the same project, but called it something else. Then both of those projects would be dismissed. Okay. They're not eligible. Okay, so just put in one project per per fund, and um, and it has to be a different uh, di different project. Okay, so can two charities partner with one application? Yes, they can. Okay. Next question: Can a not for profit organization apply for a grant round? And again, I've said it a couple of times, but this is a question we get constantly. Um, again. Not-for-profits are welcome to enter into a partnership agreement with a registered charity, uh, but we unfortunately cannot accept just not-for-profit applications at this moment. Next question. If a project has been funded in previous years, does that mean it's guaranteed to be granted this year? No. Every year we look at every application, application separately and the adjudication committee um, also looks at it um, with with new eyes. So even though you might have been successful a couple of years, uh, you, for instance, a project in the Hazel Fund, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be successful again. But please, we encourage you to apply um, and uh, we will look at every application that you send to us. Okay, the program we are applying uh, for exist across Peel region, including Mississauga, can we still apply for funding? Yes, and I alluded to that earlier. Again, you can have an organization that is servicing the Peel region. So you're doing work in Brampton, you're doing Caledon. Um, however, um, we are only going to fund what you're doing in Mississauga. This this is, you know, focus on this, because if your organization is in this category, what happens with the adjudication committee when you come in and your organization head office is in Brampton and they know that you're doing work in Brampton, they get a little nervous. How much are you doing in Mississauga? OK, how many people are you serving in Mississauga? How do you do that? OK, maybe you have a remote office. Maybe you partner with somebody and, you know, you rent space every year from Mississauga for a summer camp or something like that. But be very clear in your application how you do it. Um, because I have sadly read some applications where you're not clear and you won't get full marks uh, from the adjudication committee. You're making them nervous. Make sure that you're very explicit on how you do this, okay? Especially when your office is outside of Mississauga. Uh, make sure that you're addressing how you're helping Mississauga residents and how many people you are actually helping in Mississauga. Okay, are late applications accepted? No, uh, as Gavin mentioned, right, Gavin, the system locks it down, right? Yes, it does. Um, we're locking it down um, and it just, it locks down at five o'clock 
So there are absolutely no applications will be accepted after the deadline. And don't forget to put in the required documents, okay? Because some people will give me a nice grant application. They forget to give me their audited financial statements. They forget to give me their um, list of board of directors. Those are things that are required. And it says that in the application. So please put in everything that's required. It's not going to be helpful if you do a grant application and now you're emailing me at 510 <laughs> and saying, here's my financials. Yeah, it doesn't work. It has to go into the system. Again, I was a grant writer for years because what's the date again, Gavin, with the final date, March the... March 22nd is the cutoff. March 22nd is the cutoff. Okay, here's my suggestion. Put March 17th as your cutoff, okay? I understand. It, you've got a whole bunch of things you're doing. You might be right, you know, writing four or five grant applications at the same time, um, and you get, you know, time pressure. And also, you might be bringing it back to other people in, in your organization that are editing your, your work, and you're waiting for financials. I understand. All those pressures are happening behind the scenes. I've been there. I know what it's like. Um, but if you make make yourself a drop dead deadline that is really not the date that we're looking for, you'll have your application in early. We'll be able to see it. Um, and then if you have forgotten something, you can go back in and insert it. Like, so those financials uh, can be inserted, okay? If it's not after March the 26th, right, Gavin? It's the 26th, right? 20, 20, March 22nd. 22nd. Okay. <laughs> I'm so glad Gavin is looking after me. Okay. March the 22nd at five o'clock. Okay. So no, the answer is no. Moving on. Can we apply for more than one grant fund? Yes. I alluded to that earlier. Remember, we have four different grant rounds happening. We've got your Pendle. We've got your Hazel. We got your children. We got your Novo. Okay. You can put in a unique application to each fund. It has to be a different project, okay? Um, the foundation will not fund the same project in multiple funds. So here we have Disney, right? Gavin, we like Disney. Disney applies to Hazel for an art mural project. They can also apply to Pendle, but it has to be a completely different project. Disney, do not come to us with your art mural project in Pendle. You're bo both those applications are going to get thrown out okay, as soon as you do that. Okay, but it has to be a different project. I'm sure Disney can come up with something else that they want for Pendle. And then some charities say to me, well, isn't it kind of rude that I'm applying in all four grant rounds? Well, it's not rude. If you've got something very specific that can fit into each grant round, again, we look at it very individually and we do consider it. Um, is it a guarantee you're going to get all four grants? Yeah, I I haven't seen it happen um, that everybody that you've been funded in all four grants, but we do read them. We do consider them. So it is possible. All right. So yes, you can apply to more than one grant fund. You can. All right. So what happens? You've received your grant. You put in the applications. You did everything right. You filed it on time. You gave us the audited financial statement. You gave us the board of directors. You didn't mission drift. You did all the great stuff. You got great marks from the adjudication committee and you have received a yes from us for your grant. Congratulations. Okay. We will come to you and ask you for your electronic fund transfer information. Uh, we will get you to sign an agreement with us and tell you when your reports are due and they're due, they're due differently. Right, Gavin, this year? Yes. 30 days after your project is complete, 30 yeah. days afterwards. That's right. And we want to make sure that all the projects are completed by June 30th, 2025. Isn't that correct? That's if correct. Yeah, but we will be looking for interim reports in January. But again, we'll give you all this information when we tell you that you have been successful. Okay. And then remember to acknowledge your grant in our marketing, in your marketing materials, your website, your social media. And we have uh, some links on reporting and recognition on our website. Um, some people come to me and say, you know, how do we talk about the Community Foundation? We're so happy that you supported us this year. Where's your logo? What, uh, how can we say things? Um, you know, we want to write a press release. Um, 
do you need to look at it for uh, before we send it out? All that information is in the reporting and recognition. Thank you, for Pauline, for putting it in the chat again. But remember that this PowerPoint will be on our website. Um, Gavin and I are here to answer any of your questions um, regarding your grant application and all these processes that happen um, if you are successful, okay? Um, then consider inviting us for a site visit. We love to do this. We cannot visit anyone during the grant, uh, the grant process happening, but as soon as it closes, usually in the summer months, September, October is the best time for us to visit. Please consider um, inviting us to come and see your project. We love to do that. Um, and we often reach out to organizations to uh, follow up on the projects that they're doing. Um, okay, so um, I think that takes us to the end. Oh, good. Gavin's gonna remind you about the dates. Okay, Gavin, go ahead. Thanks, Lorraine. So I know we threw a lot of dates at you guys, but pretty much it's all here for you. Grant round opens February 26th. Uh, and it closes March 22nd. The system will lock it down. So please ensure you uh, you get your applications in before then. Deliberations are in the spring, early spring, April, May. And then approvals and declines happen. Um, email notifications happen afterwards in May, June. <clears throat> um, as mentioned, what's going to be new this year is on your application, you're going to indicate you know, what you've done before, your project end date. And your report is going to be due 30 days after that, OK? If your project end date happens to be in 2025, no problem. Just submit an interim report by the end of January of the following year, and then 30 days after your project end date. Um, and I should also say that, you know, we're going to have emails sending, being sent out to you guys to remind you of these dates, so not to worry um, if you're approved, as well as your grant agreement will have all these dates outlined as well. Um, our new grant catalog opens April 2nd, and it closes uh, June 28th. Okay, and again, that's a lockdown as well. So please ensure you have applications in by that date as well. And finally, all 2024 projects have to be completed by June 30th. Um, not the reports, but the, the project itself. So if your project is gonna be on June 30th, well, that's the final date, 2025, your report is due 30 days after that. Okay. All right, thanks. That's great, thanks for reviewing that. Um, okay. Um, Pauline, have we seen any questions coming up in our chat or in the Q&As? Yes. So I have one from the chat okay. asking, is there an expected number of beneficiaries to be reached? How okay. would you answer that? Um, sorry, expected number of beneficiaries. So for the, what, what kind of outreach should these projects have? Okay. Um, Glenn, I can see you. Do you want to answer that question? Sure, Lorraine. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Gavin and Lorraine. You guys did a great job going through all of that information. Uh, hopefully everybody appreciates all the information that they shared today. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, I think on beneficiaries, I think the question is about, um, you know, how many people does the project need to serve? And um, when we adjudicate projects, we really look at the nature of the project. So, you know, if it's a, a camp type environment, um, you know, we're hoping that it's going to serve a fair number of, of people. But if it's a very specific type of camp um, sp um, that's dealing with a very specific issue that might need one-to-one um, -one coaching for the participants, or it, it, there's a lot more care involved in the type of service that's being delivered, well, of course, we consider that. And so we recognize that those types of environments are going to serve fewer people um, uh, because of the depth of the programming that's involved. Um, and so it's really hard to answer that question because sometimes we might fund um, a performance which will serve, you know, could be open to hundreds or thousands of people. Um, and at other times for the same grant amount, we might serve a, a camp that's uh, serving a, a community with a very specific need that requires a lot of attention and a lot of detail. And of course, it's going to cost a lot more to deliver that to each individual applicant. So our adjudication committee considers all of those factors when we're reviewing the applications and, and we, we, we take that into consideration. So I would just say that um, it's really highly dependent on the situation and the community that you're serving. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Glenn. Yes, no, excellent answer. Yeah, because as you said, some um, some participants um, need a lot more help. Um, so you may have a one-on-one -on -one situation where you might not be servicing, you know, a thousand people, but we certainly take that into consideration. Thank you. 
Okay. We've had a we've had a request to put the timeline slide back up for a minute. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can People do that. Like to Was go there back something and look that, at that if we could? Something that. Yeah, and again, we're going to be putting this PowerPoint on our website. All these dates will be uh, available to you. Um, yeah, yeah, and it'll be it'll be published in the newsletter as well. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. So we have a couple of other questions in the Q and A. To what extent must a partnership exist between a not-for-profit and registered charity? Can the project we are seeking funding for be a project that is under the operations of the not-for-profit? Yes. Um, yes. Sometimes the not-for-profit is actually delivering the project, but the registered charity is the one that we actually pay. Okay, so the registered charity would end up paying the not-for-profit for their services. That's basically how it works. I hope that's helpful. Again, if you want to reach out to us, um, we could. You can always email us directly, and we can phone you um, and and walk you through those types of processes. Okay. Um, I see there's a, another question here from Monica. Um, I would like to clarify if our project ends 2025, we would have to submit two reports. Yeah, an interim in January um, and then a final 30 days. You've got it exactly right, okay? So again, the interim report, because we have the, um, uh, the funding round opening in February, we'd like to see where you're at. We do understand that some projects leak over, um, you know, the actual application date for uh, the, the pre for the next year. So we need an interim report and then 30 days after. If our project yeah. ends in 2024, we would only need to submit one report. Yeah. So yeah. And basically, as soon as you've finished your project and you've spent our money, okay, then you can submit the report. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily, say if you picked a, a, an end date, um, you said, I think I'm going to uh, finish this project in November of 2024, but you ended up finishing it in September. Okay. Sometimes that happens and you've spent the money. You can submit the report early. You don't have to wait. Okay. And as Gavin said, as soon as your project is finished, it's top of mind to you. You know exactly how much you've spent. You know the outcomes. You probably have pictures to share, those types of things. So don't you don't always have to wait to the deadline. You can do it early if you want, um, but it definitely has to be done from 30 days after. I hope that's helpful. Okay. Pauline, did you see anything else in the chat that we should talk about? Sorry, I muted myself. Uh, the only other thing I was thinking uh, that I saw was somebody said, besides getting a $2,000 grant, do you believe the grant catalog is a good way for organizations to introduce themselves to the advised fund holders. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially if they have never uh, thought about you before and maybe you've never applied for funding from us, um, certainly it's, it's a great way to do that, um, to let uh, the funders know and to us for, uh, for, and to update your information because some organizations, you may have changed your name, you may have changed your mission statement somewhat. So current information is always helpful all the way around. I would encourage everyone to put in, uh, to fill out that little catalog, one pager. All right. Um, I think we're getting close to the end of the hour. Um, again, I still encourage people to um, say hello in the chat. I know there were some people that came in later um, and it's really wonderful to see all the great uh, charitable organizations participating in our funding information uh, session today. And uh, I just really love to thank you, especially on this Valentine's Day, about all the great work that you're doing in the community. We can't exist without you. Um, you know, you're really making a huge impact in the community and we're so proud to be able to support uh, your efforts. So we look forward to your grant applications for 2024 um, and uh, seeing the wonderful work that you're doing. Um, and um, again, uh, thank you very much for the Community Foundation of Mississauga staff, Pauline, Arisha, uh, Gavin, and Glenn, would you like to have some final comments, Glenn, to say goodbye to everyone? Uh, thanks, Lorraine. Uh, and 
I hadn't prepared anything, but I just wanted to say, uh, again, you guys did a great job. I want to thank everybody for attending this morning. And as Lorraine said, of course, our work is dependent on the, the projects that uh, that we grant. And so it's always uh, it's the most exciting time of the year at the foundation when we get to review all the, the projects that are happening in the community. Um, and we get to grant out uh, funds to make those projects come to life. And so we're really looking forward to seeing your applications and looking forward to working with you all. Uh, so thanks again for attending today. And final words, don't forget about the matching fund that we have. Um, if your organization would like to have some more information, you can reach out to us and we would be so happy to be able to uh, help you with um, investing your funds um, to make it a little easier on your operations going forward. Again, we're looking forward to your applications. Uh, Gavin, any final words? Uh, no, thank you very much everyone and for all the good work you do and look forward to receiving your applications um next week okay all right okay goodbye for now